changing faith and his view of an approaching apocalypse. This was BBC Two. In London tonight, a massive breakdown at Battersea Power Station brought chaos to the centre of the capital. The power cut was caused by a fire in the giant building and a score of fire engines was called in to fight the blaze. All over town, traffic lights went out, tubes stopped and even the windmill theatre closed. But the biggest disappointment was at BBC Television Centre where the curtain failed to go up on the opening night of a brand new channel, BBC Two. BBC Two was due to go on the air at 20 past seven. Its first presenter was Dennis Toohey. The first night that wasn't was preceded by hours of rehearsal for this very short 10 minute routine, which is going to be the opening of the channel and a publicity magazine for that night and for the week. It wasn't very complicated. A few clips, a few bits of script, which would help to establish the three main presenters of that little magazine. John Stone, Pamela Donald and myself. It was rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed again uh, all through the afternoon. There we were, all lined up, as it were. And the first thing I remember about it was that there weren't any hands on the clock. We were supposed to open it with the hands ticking up to the clock and then it would cut to the studio and there we'd all be. And somebody had forgotten to put hands on the clock, which showed the state of nerves. I mean, there was a director watching the thing. He hadn't noticed there weren't any hands on the clock. We broke after about the fifth run-through when we felt there was really nothing more we could do to polish this little uh, work of art that we'd been preparing. And I remember being somewhat uneasy, just natural nerves, if you like, first night nerves, wandering back into the presentation area. And I wandered into the gallery where there was nobody at all, and I looked at the monitors. This was just about seven o'clock. We were due on in about 20 minutes. And all the screens were blank, and I mean totally blank, dead. Not flashing or strobing or anything, just utterly blank, as though you had switched off your set at home. And I wandered back into the bar of Television Centre where the others were, and as I did so, somebody else, uh, one of the senior executives of the presentation department, came in and said, my God, there's been a power failure. We're cut off. We can't put out BBC Two. Meanwhile, at the BBC's old studios at Alexandra Palace, frantic efforts were made to resume normal service on BBC One. BBC Two viewers remained in the dark. Well, it was a very, very exciting night for us. And we were looking forward to BBC Two. We needed it. You know, there's nothing sells television like television. So we set this window up with about 30 sets, all tuned to BBC Two. We had people inside the shop, sets tuned to BBC Two. Everybody waiting outside, and of course we waited, we waited, we waited. Um, in the end, we had to call it all off. It was rather, it was very amusing. In fact, I think it did an awful lot of good for the BBC. The pub publicity there was about it was tremendous. We'd attracted the press of the world. I mean, really, I don't know, there were hundreds of press people down there uh, waiting for this great event. And uh, all of a sudden, all the lights went out. Now, from the press point of view, of course, it was great because there they were, having a good time. So all they had to do was just sit back, pick up a phone, go on eating and drinking, phone their story and carry on for the rest of the night, see, enjoying themselves. But the publicity we got for the first night, the front page publicity, I don't suppose BBC Two has ever had publicity like it since. It was everywhere. Next day, power restored, they tried again. We recognised that tragic though the first night had been in that it didn't happen. There were comic elements to it too, and a lot of people other than ourselves thought the whole thing was very funny. So perhaps we ought to indicate that we weren't taking ourselves too seriously. Out of which the corny idea of the candle emerged. BBC Two. Programme start in five minutes. What it meant for me was simply another afternoon of nerves because I was quite sure that the longer you correctly rehearse blowing out a candle, the less chance there is that you'll actually do it when the time comes.
Good evening. This is BBC Two. I think it was somewhat appropriate that, uh, and ironic that uh, with this new breakthrough into 625 line technology, it was one of the oldest pieces of technology that man has had that, uh, that started us off and got us going. Using the great resources of modern television, let us return to the last century. The opening program, put back from the night before, was a send-up of broadcasting history with Ivor Cutler, Bruce Lacey, and yet another candle gag. In fact, it was this new programme for the under fives which had quietly launched BBC Two earlier in the day. Here's a house. Here's a door. Windows. One, two, three, four. Ready to knock. Turn the lock. It's play school. Hello. I'm Virginia. Hello, I'm Gordon. My name is Dennis Toohey, and this is the line-up studio from which, all being well, BBC programmes, BBC Two programmes, will start each evening from now on. Now, first of all, let me introduce you to some of the elements that go to make up the new service. This is the identification symbol, the hallmark, that you'll be seeing regularly in one form or another. Now I'd like you to meet the line-up team. First of all, my fellow anchorman, John Stone. As the dark minutes ticked by in the studio last night, I ignored the merry cries of Bert's pulled the wrong plug or Charlie's put the mockers on again. I took comfort in the Daily Sketch horoscope for yesterday, which said a feeling that others are against you is unfounded. And next, the girl who would have been the first woman to have appeared on BBC Two were it not for Play School at 11 o'clock this morning. Program reporter Pamela Donald. Ah, yes, but I'll tell you something, and with the Battersea Power Station, please take note, I intend to be the last tonight. We were very different from the announcers on the other channel, who used to go through the normal promotional material, telling people what was on. We were very much encouraged to be ourselves. I mean, almost to the degree that you could come up and say, um, tonight at nine o'clock you'll be seeing our science programme, so and such. Personally, I found this extremely boring, but you, particularly if you have a Bachelor of Science degree, um, might find the whole thing totally enchanting, so uh, have a look. You know, it was that's going to the opposite extreme. It wasn't as bad as that. But you were allowed to criticise, and you were supposed to get the attention focused on you and the programmes in a very different way from the other channel. BBC Two had begun as a gleam in the eye of the Pilkington Committee. Dr. Richard Hoggart was one of its members. It was clear when we were meeting as a committee, a Pilkington committee, that uh, two channels quite soon could be available, two more. And then there was a very interesting debate, which now is extremely old-fashioned, and the debate centred on whether there is enough material to have more than two channels in a country of 50 million people. Sounds really old now. Then the next question for the committee was who should have it, or who should have the first one? And we decided without much doubt that it should go to the BBC, and the grounds are simple. ITA, we thought then, ITV, was in a bad way, and we said it had better put its house in order before it takes on a second channel. So the recommendation was one channel for BBC now, ITA when it's in better shape. In 1955, the arrival of ITV had um, created a terrible trauma inside the BBC. In almost every program area, the BBC found itself deeply disadvantaged. It wasn't able to compete. In news, its performance was pathetic. In many other program areas, which were apparently were part of the Ark of the Covenant, which defined the BBC, the companies were running rings about the BBC. The um, arrival of the Pilkington uh, Committee, with its brief to 
report on the state of British television uh, at the end of the 1950s um, provided the BBC with a marvellous chance to re-establish the balance. And you can see it almost as the alamein of the, of the BBC's position vis-a-vis -vis its public and the establishment. The start of BBC Two was an enormous feeling of relief for people in the television service who'd been frustrated at the way that the hours were being kept down. Occasionally one got another half hour of programme time, or an hour perhaps. But here suddenly we were getting another 30 hours a week. And we were moving away, into, away from the old four or five line standards into six to five lines with the much better picture that that produced, into the new high frequency bands, and also we were going to be able to start colour, not immediately because they were still arguing what kind of colour, but within three years, colour television. Most of us had a very real sense of mission. I mean, it seems awfully corny today, but this was the case. We really believed that we had that last chance, that marvellous second chance, certainly, granted to us to show that the BBC could both live up to its charter and the, and the basic ideals of Reith, at the same time, compete with ITV. Nobody was more eager for BBC Two to begin broadcasting than the television manufacturers and retailers who needed the new channel as much as it needed them. If you wanted to watch BBC Two, you had to get yourself a dual standard set because BBC One was still going out on 405 lines and BBC Two was going on 625. Now this meant uh, money. You had to invest in a new set. Also, you had to have a new aerial. This was one of the original dual standard sets, specifically made so that people could receive BBC Two at the time. Previously, they'd been using this tuner, which selected Channel One for BBC One and Channel Nine for ITV. You now turn that to a little letter there, marked U, which stood for UHF, and then tuned this tuner here to Channel 33 for BBC Two. We didn't have any information about programmes uh, early enough for the manufacturers and the dealers. They wanted to go ahead, sell sets. And so it was decided that we would have some sort of symbol. And they chose the kangaroo because of BBC One being the mother, and then the little one could be BBC Two. BBC One they called Hullabaloo because it was all to do with promotion, but they couldn't think of a name for BBC Two. And after a long meeting one day, and they still hadn't thought of one, somebody suddenly said, well, why the hell don't we call it custard, because custard goes with anything. Hello, good evening, Brown Johnston here, and on behalf of Hullabaloo and Custard, welcome to South End. It's not raining, it's very blustery, but it is a fine night here. And for the next 15 minutes or so, BBC Two is really getting launched with a bang. And I'll do my best to pop in between the pops to tell you something about the fireworks you're going to see and hear. Uh, by the way, if your dog's in the room with you, we don't consider this is a suitable programme for him or her. One of the ideas that we had at that time was that we did not want to make it into an entirely highbrow programme. But the problem was, if you're having, say, football on BBC one, what do you do on BBC Two? What is the opposite of football? Is it drama? Is it discussion? Is it light entertainment? Um, and we uh, came across the idea early in the planning that perhaps the idea was to have, best idea would be to have a major big program each, each night of the week. One night it had to be education because we were committed to do that. This was before the start of the open university programs. Uh, another night, perhaps it would be a major play or a major concert or a major light entertainment programme, but a big programme. The opening night centrepiece was this production of Kiss Me Kate, starring Howard Keel and the TW3 girl, Millicent Martin. A troop of strolling players are we. Not stars like L.B. Mayers are we. But just a simple man who roams about the land, dispensing for their own rivality. They hope to give distraction are we. No theater guild attraction are we. 
but just a crazy group that never seems to grow around the map of little Italy. We open in Venice, we next play Verona, then on to Cremona. Lots of laughs in Cremona. There was an expectation, obviously, it was going to be a more serious channel, but there was also the expectation due to the publicity that was around, that it was going to be a gay, funny, happy channel. There was going to be kangaroos jumping all over the place, Danny Kaye, Montevani, all these wonderful delights, westerns and uh, thrillers and that. So there was a kind of mixed uh, excitement about what was going to be seen. We open in Venice, we next play Verona, then on to Cremona. That's a whale in Cremona. Our next jump is Paula, that harmless, harmless man is, then man you are, then man you are. Then we open again, where? In Venice! Uh, they had this curious idea that they should have different things for every night so that on um, uh, uh, Tuesday night it was going to be educational and uh, on Wednesday night it was going to be repeats and on Thursday night uh, I think it was going to be uh, minority oriented. This format known as Flavor of the Night and Seven Faces of the Week was less a curious idea than a means of promotion. The, uh, the Seven Faces was partly uh, a positive thought that it gave us the chance to get the most out of what we had was also a process of rationalizing the fact that we didn't have enough programs or resources of money to really make a seven-day schedule work properly. So we, we, we put faces over the schedule and, and made it look pretty good. Mathematics, 1964. Revolution. These are challenging and possibly frightening words, aren't they? Well, we've got 20 programs to explain them. We call this a threefold revolution, and I want to try to distinguish the three strands. First of all, there's a revolution in the status of the mathematician. Secondly, there's a revolution in the subject itself, in the subject of mathematics. And thirdly, there is most certainly a revolution in the teaching of the subject. It started, as we think one might say disastrously, if you remember, by going in for genre programming by night. You know, Friday night is a marmy night, and Thursday night is something else night, politics night, whatever. That went very quickly. Then it began to slice things. I remember one of the first week's programs, which is absolutely typical. You had line up to begin with, then you had two solid hours of further education in four half-hour blocks. Then to show that you weren't just for highbrows, there was a bit of Duke Ellington because all highbrows like jazz. I mean, you almost expect football next. And now, our next number, we give you three guesses as to what the title is. Well, we normally do give our audience three guesses, but uh, you're so hip, we just don't dare. Highbrow, even elitist image of BBC Two persisted, and it wasn't helped by the fact that for the first few months, programmes could be seen only in London and the South East. We were on the receiving end of a lot of criticism, which um, was pretty unfair, if, you, if one tries to be objective about it. Um, the press has never had uh, all that much enthusiasm for the fact that television exists at all. In the 60s, they were just, but only just getting used to the fact they were going to be around for a long time, television was. And some newspapers had a vendetta against uh, the BBC, the Express group in particular, the critics like Milton Schumann and others were uh, continuously sniping at television in general and at the BBC in particular. Uh, some of the popular papers really went to town on it. There was one paper which, uh, big banner headline, BBC Two is a flop. And uh, that really did us quite a lot of harm because later on when we were taking BBC Two through the country, 
you'd often meet people going into new areas and they would say, oh, well, I hear it's a flop. They had this preconceived notion that it was terribly stuffy, that it was all concerts and science programmes or dramas that nobody would understand. In Conversations for Tomorrow, J.B. Priestley entertains two distinguished guests to dinner. Yeah, but I think, I think what Freddy says is, is, it comes to the same, which is a question of freedom. You want, you want, to, you yes, want, to, to, you want to feel free uh, to make mistakes. And there would be J.B. Priestley and flanked after dinner with a coffee cup and a, and a, and a glass of brandy by, I mean, that's the old style, by, um, say, A.J. Ayres, say, Isaiah Boleyn. And if you look at them now, they do look extremely old-fashioned and also stagey. But they were good, relaxed, intelligent conversations, making no uh, allowances for people who don't have some sort of background. And I suppose the equivalent of them today is that programme called Voices on Channel 4. We think it's better to be free to make mistakes than not to be free and uh, than to make mistakes at the cost of losing freedom. To be free from making mistakes, to make no mistakes, to be infallible but unfree. This is certainly yeah. what I emotionally feel. Now, what is, what is this freedom? But exactly, how does it stand up intellectually? You see, Thank you very much. it certainly doesn't mean acting entirely spontaneously because no. none of us does this. I mean, I didn't, I didn't uh, we are, after all, the products of our education, of all the stimuli we've had, of all the people who've said things to us, the books we've read, uh, and so on. And we recognize all this and don't feel in the least threatened by it. We still take credit uh, for our successes and feel remorse um, for our misdeeds, shame for our failures, and so on. And I wonder, and I'd like to have this refuted, well, there's any difference here between being conditioned in a sort of haphazard way, of which we're unaware, and being conditioned in a planned way. Well, now, why should we um, think it's perfectly right to be conditioned in a haphazard, inefficient way, uh, even though it makes us less happy, and rebel against, against being conditioned in a planned, efficient way, even though it makes us happier? It seems totally irrational. Oh, Yet yes. I feel this quite as much as you. I, th I think that... Um the critics was more or less had an effect on the people that ran it. I'm, I'm sure that the people like Hugh Green, Michael Peacock, and everything else changed direction quite quickly. Not because of viewing figures, because they weren't likely to get it, but because of critical reaction. I think people found it indigestible for one evening to have the same type of subject, particularly on the more serious one. But it wasn't long before it was changed into a, and became an alternative program. Then uh, it began to take off, and there were programs like Danny, the Danny Kaye show, The Virginian became very popular. Um, and of course, there were some programs right from the beginning, which we've still got with us. There was Play School and Horizon. I think BBC Two has probably produced the, the highest standard of television uh, that Britain has, has still produced. I once wrote a book called The Least Worst Television uh, in the World talking about British television, I would say BBC Two is the least worst channel uh, that we have. In line-up this evening, Pamela Donnell promised viewers that she would be the last woman on BBC Two tonight. And here she is to honour that pledge. <laughs> we had a phone call tonight asking, is Van Acker really your cricket correspondent? Well, who better to answer than Van Acker himself? Hi there. And if you want to know what tomorrow's weather is going to be like, I can tell you that too. It will be a little warmer with more sunshine and only scattered showers. Love from Jack Armstrong. That's what I like about BBC Two, the personal touch. Well, that's all from Close Down tonight. We've certainly had ourselves a ball here. Can we come again tomorrow night, maybe round about 7.20 in lineup? And now at one minute past midnight, may I wish you on behalf of everyone here on BBC Two, a very good night.
Sunday's edition of Did You See will be featuring highlights from the first 20 years of BBC Two and discussing current programmes with a team of guest critics who've all been associated with the channel. They include Joan Bakewell, Jeremy Isaacs and BBC Two's first programme chief, Michael Peacock. That's on Easter Day.